Welcome to my channel, Midnight Stories, where you find horror stories that scare you. Before watching, please press like to support me in producing more stories. This helps in spreading the video and reaching more people. Thank you for your support and enjoy watching. I'm going to tell this story to you all so you can understand what I have been going through. Obviously no one would believe me, but I'm tired of keeping it deep down inside of me. No matter what is said, the only thing you will read here is the truth. I don't really know where it all began, so I'll just start ten years ago. I was thirteen years old at the time, and my dad and I had nothing to do during the summer. We had thought of going camping, so we bought a fairly affordable trailer. I wasn't that interested in camping much. I was always an inside person, if you get what I mean. I would just lounge around in my room playing video games. I would watch TV, eat Cheetos, or just sleep for hours on. But when we got to the campground, I was astonished. The campground was large and beautiful, with trailers everywhere. We had lots of fun. We went fishing and roasted marshmallows on the campfire. They had a large pool and even a lake to swim in. I don't think I've ever had so much fun as I did back then. After that camping trip, we went to a lot more of them every year. It had been the most fun thing to do during the summer for me, but that all went downhill six years later. Radio 1 Six years ago, something had happened, something that I, to this day, still can't figure out. Summer had finally come, and I was excited to go camping. My dad had actually booked a campground, a pretty cheap one. It was at Pennsylvania, which was hours away from where I lived. It didn't look as cool as our first camping trip, but I was fine with it. I was thrilled that we got to go camping again. We got in the car first thing on Friday morning and drove off. It was quite a long ride, but we eventually got there. I looked out the window when my dad woke me up. The campground did indeed look old and a little decaying, but it still had a sense of coziness in it, so I gave it a try. The nature did make up for other views of the campground. There was only one swimming pool and a lake. Despite what I'd seen so far, I was quite surprised to see that our campsite still looked fairly nice. It had a rusted old iron ring for the campfire and plenty of space. My dad told me to check out the pools, the lakes, and basically everything else. I pondered around the dirty lake as I saw that it was getting pretty late. I decided on going back to the trailer and going to bed. I let out a faint yawn as I went back to the trailer and went to bed. It was so comfortable that I fell asleep instantly. But this isn't the point. The campground being old was not the problem. It was when I woke up in the middle of the night. I was awoken. I heard a noise, a loud one. It sounded like it came from a radio. It's just music, I thought to myself. But it didn't sound much like music. It sounded horrendous and nasty. But there was something familiar about that song that I couldn't figure out. It didn't stop, and it was getting really loud. I tried to ignore it, but I could not. I tried to cover my ears and use earplugs, but those didn't work either. It just got louder and louder. When I looked outside the window, I could see nothing, so I woke up my dad so he could find out where this music was coming from. He looked a little mad that I woke him up, but sighed and went to open up the window. He told me he could hear nothing and that I was probably dreaming. Couldn't hear anything? What did that mean? I certainly heard it, but I was too tired to argue with him and he too was tired to argue with me. So I went back to bed and covered my ears. The music slowly stopped, and with a sigh of relief I fell asleep. It didn't end there, though. The music played again every night, loudly, and woke me up. I was getting tired of the music. The fact that it played the same song every night made me shake a bit. I decided I would find out myself where the music was coming from, my dad obviously wouldn't go out in the cold to find out who was playing the music, so I was alone. I went outside the trailer quietly, trying not to wake my dad. It was unusually cold that night, but I could get through it. I peered around the site, trying to find where it all had been coming from. Nothing. No lights out, no noise, except for the radio noises. But there was one thing I noticed, something that hadn't been there when I looked out the window when I usually heard the noises. There was a red light, coming from within the woods. The radio noises became clear to me, and I could finally see that it was coming from the red light. So, as planned, I decided to follow the light, hoping to give these people a piece of my mind. I went into the dark, creepy woods. There were branches and mud puddles everywhere, so it was hard for me to get around. 
This was ridiculous. I can't believe this guy was making me jump through hell to get him to turn off music. I thought I was just being stupid. Before I decided to go back, I finally got to the light. The light was shining above the garage of an old cabin. The cabin was creepier than the sights of the old campground I had left. It was covered in moss, and it was wet. There was no one in the garage, so I went to the other side to find out where. When I found a window, I looked inside and saw a man. His face was covered in oil and blood together. He was wearing jeans, a white shirt with sweat marks, and was very skinny. I saw the radio next to him, playing the same music, along with a few dusty old knives that were covered in blood. I covered my mouth with my hands with regret. I had no idea what he was doing with those knives, and I didn't want to know. I could not bear it any longer. As I made my plan to run away and get back to the trailer, I saw the man turn his face to me. He was looking at me, staring into my eyes. There was sweat covering my entire body, and my heart was racing. I could not stop shaking when I saw that his eyes were of a demon's, all red. When I made my decision to run home as fast as I can and call the police, I did not have my cell phone with me at the time. He put his hands on a gigantic axe and swung it at something on the ground. It made a noise as if it cut through flesh, but again, I didn't want to know. I could have just witnessed a crime scene, a kidnapping, or God knows what. Then he slowly turned his head to me. He gave me a grin and smiled at me. That was when I finally ran from him. I tried my hardest to run as fast as I could. I wasn't very focused on the puddles and sticks all around my path, so I tripped and landed on a rock. I don't really remember what happened between when I fainted and the time I woke up the next morning in my bed. I sat up on my bed for a moment. Many thoughts circled my head such as, what had happened? Why did I wake up in my bed? When I asked my dad if he moved me to my bed, he gave me a face of confusion and shook his head. But what if that man carried me back here? If he did, then why? I had large doubts that this was real. I couldn't keep thinking about it. I was getting sick to my stomach. That was the only thing that kept me from dialing 911. We left the campground in the usual way, but during the car ride, my dad was starting to think I didn't have fun on the trip. I just looked outside the window during the entire ride, not able to relax or fall asleep. During the following months after that trip, we didn't go camping that much anymore. He didn't want to take me because I looked too scared to go or too sad. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. And my grades at school were plummeting. I saw myself getting depressed over what happened, and I was losing a lot of weight. Basically, I had nightmares. Whenever I was in my bed at night, I always thought I felt him touching me. Sometimes I even saw him outside my window. My parents were very scared about me indeed, so they took me to a therapist. The therapist couldn't even help me because he didn't know what I had gone through. He just told my parents that I was a teenager going through natural things. They were forced to accept that, despite how scared they were for me. Damn it, why didn't I just ignore the music? I feel bad about what they were going through. The trauma was just driving me insane, and it felt too real to be a dream. You aren't supposed to see shit like this at teenagehood. I am 23 now. Overlooking back on what happened, I decided to go back to that decomposing old campground to investigate. It was closed and abandoned to my surprise, so I climbed over the metal fence and into the campground. I looked around and saw a few old demolished cabins and a few deer hopping by. I always remembered our site number, which was 056. When I arrived at our old camping spot, I retraced my steps to that old cabin deep in the woods. I was very surprised when I saw the cabin, exactly as I saw it that night four years ago. When I looked in, I saw nothing, nothing. There wasn't even any proof of blood or marks on the walls. I hadn't felt so great in years to find out I only had a nightmare, but then I looked behind me and saw a small radio on the table. I pressed a button on the radio and it turned on to the song, Young Girl. I smiled for a second because that was my father's favorite song. He would play on his CD player almost all of the time. I chuckled for a minute, then I realized something. I decided to hit the radio a little bit, then it reversed and it all came to me. That was the same song that had kept me up at night ten years ago, but deeper and in reverse. I looked at the ground next to the radio, and I saw a little skeleton, half decomposing. It was a child's.
Back in the day, I was stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. My time in the military is not something I like to think about too often. I like to think about how it ended even less. A few months before the end of my military contract, we were scheduled to head to the field for training for about two weeks. For those not familiar with what the field is, it's basically two weeks of weapons, tactics, and equipment training at a designated spot picked out by command. A lot of soldiers don't like the field since you're cut off from all commodities like cell phones, bars, and most importantly, showers. I personally enjoyed the experience in the past and enjoyed the training with my battle buddies. The last time we went to the field, it was a month-long affair, so two weeks was not the end of the world for me. My alarm clock woke me up around 0330. The weapons draw would be at 0430, which gave me an hour to wake up, take my last warm shower for two weeks, and have a proper homemade breakfast. Living in the barracks had its perks sometimes, and being within walking distance of the company was convenient on days like these. When I got to the company, a group of soldiers was already sitting around, barely awake, some downright asleep, and others chugging down energy drinks as both their breakfast and to stay awake. I felt completely out of place here as I was in my 20s. Considered a fossil in the military, most of the other soldiers in my platoon weren't old enough to smoke, not that the laws stopped them. We lined up to sign out our weapons and blanks for our training. Most of us carried both M4S and M17s into the field. I pitied the M249 gunners having to carry those heavy bitches around. Once everyone had arrived, gotten their shit and geared up, it was around 0545. We horseshoed around our platoon leader who gave us a simple mission brief. Just follow my truck and keep your distance just like you learned in training for potential IEDs on the road. Gunners, let me catch you not covering your sectors of fire, and I'm going to smoke the shit out of you once we get to our training area. Everyone got to their respective Humvees and were ready to roll out by 0600. With my luck, I ended up being the driver on Humvee 01 where our fearless platoon leader decided to ride shotgun with. It took us about an hour of driving until we reached the training site. The spot was far away from base, heavily wooded area where we would make our home for the next two weeks. We parked the Humvees in a large open field and spent the next several hours setting up tents where leadership would hang out and give classes in. By the time we had finished setting camp up, dusk was setting in and the firewatch roster was already being worked on. Luckily, we had enough people in the platoon that anyone getting a turn at guarding the camp only had to do it for one hour. I drew the short stick and ended getting woken up for my guard shift around 0300. I was given night vision goggles by the last guard, and I made myself to the makeshift guard post on camp. The guard post was a Humvee located in the middle of camp that was good for 360 security. I hopped on the roof and dropped to the gunner's nest. Most of the shift. Most of the shift was uneventful as most fire guards are. I mostly tried out the NVGs to see my surroundings at night. The dark woods were as clear as day with a green tint to them. I was able to see so well that I saw two privates breaking away from camp to do a little fraternizing. They were both married, by the way. I decided to give them some privacy and look elsewhere, and as I did, I noticed something creepy. I was barely hanging on to consciousness when I spotted something in the woods. Directly in front of our camp, maybe a hundred meters away, there was a figure by the tree line. From where I was, it looked like a man was observing me. No way he could make out much in the dark from such a distance away. But I felt like he was staring right into my soul. My wristwatch alarm went off, and I almost shit my pants. By the time I looked away to turn my alarm off, the figure in the woods was gone. I didn't dwell on it too much as I was extremely tired, and my eyes were probably playing a trick on me. I left to wake up the next guard per the roster, and I slept inside my Humvee in case my eyes weren't deceiving me. Wake up was around 0800, and after chow, it was time for our first class in land nav. Luckily, no lieutenants would be in charge of any maps. We broke off into groups of three and set off into the woods. We received various coordinates we would have to travel to in the woods, where probably some sort of item would be waiting for us. The woods were untouched in most of the area we traveled through, which meant we had to keep an eye out for uneven terrain and venomous snakes. 
A few miles into our hike, we reached our first coordinate location where a lone cone was waiting for us in the middle of the woods. On it was a photo of a young soldier with only first and last name to identify him. I decided to pull out my cell phone and take a picture, so we had evidence we made it to each and every coordinate. Before we knew it, we had hiked half a day in those woods, and by the time we had made it to our last coordinate, the sun was beginning to set. We better start heading back before it gets dark. I don't want to be lost in these woods, I said while taking out my flashlight to light the way when night fell. We had started making our way back to camp when not ten minutes in, night had engulfed the woods. One of our group, Carrion, had a disturbing comment to make. Guys, I think we're being followed. The mere thought sent shivers down my spine, but I tried to ignore the feeling. We made a quick stop and I replied, What makes you say the... Before I could finish talking, I heard it, and I think everyone else heard it too. Somewhere away from us, maybe thirty meters in the direction we had just come from, was the sound of leaves and grass being crushed by something walking on them. Whatever was making the sound must have seen us stop, because the steps stopped abruptly. I didn't want to seem too concerned to keep my other two battle buddies from falling into some sort of panic. Come on, enough rest. I signaled for them to keep going. The other soldier, Diaz, moved up next to me. Do you think it's some sergeant fucking with us? He quietly whispered, not to alert whoever was following us. Whatever it is, it's not an animal. It stopped when we did to not alert us. Correon moved up to join the conversation. Should we make a run for it? I'm sure we could make back faster if we ran. No one among us wanted to run in the dark with heavy equipment in an unknown land. I shut the idea down almost immediately. We don't know what we are dealing with. If it's a predator, running might provoke it. Keep your bearings, and if it gets too close, fire warning shots. It won't know we are just packing blanks. We kept making our way back to camp, our guard up every step of the way. With every minute that went by, we were sure whatever was following us was not someone from camp fucking with us. They would have tried something by now, maybe some sort of ambush to teach us a lesson of some kind. But whoever or whatever they were, they kept their distance, the only evidence of their presence was slightly out-of-sync footsteps from our own in the darkness. By the time we were about a mile from camp, he made his move. Something ran past us in the dark. Whatever it was, it was fast. Every time one of us tried to catch a glimpse of it with our flashlights, we would only see the forest and its trees. We saw the glowing eyes in the dark first, watching from afar and slowly creeping closer. There were many of them. I counted half a dozen set of eyes until one got impatient enough to get spotted by one of us. Diaz was pointing his flashlight to a tree ten meters from us, and hugging the tree trunk was a thin figure, patchy hair covering parts of its body, bony hands attached to what seemed like razor-sharp claws and a grotesque ear-to-ear -ear smile. Somebody fired a burst shot, sending the creature in front of us running on all fours to somewhere in the darkness. Pure panic had a death grip over us. I barely remember sprinting in the other direction courtesy of adrenaline. I recall my heavy breathing and how out of breath I was running at top speed with full gear on. I remember shooting at glowing eyes in the darkness and the deafening sound that followed. I remember somebody screaming in the dark, and me not even stopping to look back at who it was. I remember somebody yelling at me. Then I realized it was a sergeant who was trying to get me to respond, trying to snap me out of my catatonic state. Specialist, what the fuck happened? He continued to yell as I was able to finally react. I didn't say anything immediately. I realized I was back at camp. My platoon was staring at me in horror, and I noticed I was covered in blood. I was the only one of my group that had made it out of the woods. There's something in the woods we need to leave now. I instinctively pointed my M4 back at where I had come from, remembering the futileness of it as I was firing blanks. Suddenly I found myself being tackled to the ground and restrained by multiple soldiers who disarmed me and knocked me out. Turns out coming out of the woods all bloodied up and missing two battle buddies did not inspire confidence in my word. When I came to, I was inside one of the tents that were being used by leadership as a makeshift prison for me. My hands and legs were tied up with zip ties, and there were two guards watching me who immediately told our platoon leader I was awake. When he walked into the tent, he was in full Vietnam mode, and I knew I was in for some torture. To my surprise, he just grabbed a chair and sat in front of me. I'm only going to ask this once. 
Where are the bodies of Diaz and Correon? I promise you, if you answer anything else than an exact location, you're going to have a very bad day, soldier. We have a search party out in the woods right now, and your cooperation could make this move faster. I was in complete shock. He didn't believe it yet, but he had just sent another group of soldiers to their deaths unnecessarily. You gotta call them back here. They don't know what's out there. My platoon leader decked me across the face, then proceeded to kick my ribs while I was on the ground. When he was finished, the only thing I asked was for him to check on the group to see that I wasn't lying. He seemed to consider beating me some more before he reached into one of his pant pockets and retried a walkie. LT, this is platoon daddy. Come in. The static and zero reply was deafening. I told you, there's something in the woods and you just sent those men to die. He kept trying the radio a few more times until both of us were able to hear faint gunfire in the distance. The platoon sergeant ran out of the tent and I was left bleeding where I was. They had taken my bulletproof vest off and searched me while I was unconscious. I didn't have enough luck left to find my multi-tool in one of my pockets. The guards came back into the tent and cut my restraints, helping me out outside. Everyone was in defensive positions around the camp, no doubt under some foolish belief that they could take whatever was coming for us. I heard a deafening sound and realized soldiers were shooting at something in the dark. The guards that were dragging me across camp suddenly dumped me next to an equipment tent and ran off to join whatever commotion was happening. The tent had equipment meant for troop training, and I immediately recognized the box where they had stored the NVGs. I quickly grabbed one and turned it on to see what the hell was going on outside. Soldiers were being attacked by the same creatures that attacked my group in the woods. Again I could make up six creatures cutting through an entire platoon of good friends. I used the NVGs to low crawl across camp and avoid the creature's attention. My plan was to get to a Humvee and potentially make it back to base with some luck. I tried to ignore the screams of terror around me after the gunfire died down. When I managed to crawl to the nearest truck, I saw the reason for the screams around me. Two creatures were holding a soldier down, one by his arms, another by his legs, while two others were digging into his belly and eating his intestines. The soldier, who thanks to the night vision, I could tell was our platoon leader was screaming in terror as they ate him alive. Once his screams died down like he had gone to sleep, the two creatures holding him down pulled on his limbs, ripping them clean off. I managed to get to a Humvee undetected. Luckily we don't keep them closed and no keys are needed to turn them on. I gently and quietly opened the door and flipped the switch to turn the Humvee on. It roared as loudly as an eighteen-wheeler and when the lights came up, a group of those creatures were dining on another soldier ten feet in front of me. The soldier actually reached a hand out for help before finally succumbing. I shifted the stick to drive and was ready to run the fuckers over when I noticed light tapping on my window. One of those things was standing outside, lightly tapping the window glass with its bloody claws, and smiling maniacally at me with its blood-stained mouth. I floored it. I drove over the creatures in my way and drove for miles until I managed to reach the military base, where I was promptly arrested and thrown in the brig for a while. After what I guess was their investigation into my version of events, I was released from imprisonment and medically discharged from service. I used the pension that the government gave me to move as far away as I could from those woods in North Carolina. I will be there for you, day or night, she said, and the time between times. That raised an eyebrow, but not my suspicions. I had blindly loved Abigail Thorpe for six years. At the time her peculiar wedding vow seemed endearing. She was only adding a little sprinkle and spice to the ceremony, as she did with all things. That was what I naively believed. Richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, Abigail continued, glued or unglued, my second eyebrow raised, leveling with the first. I will protect you, my fiancé said. You will be safeguarded during your resting hours. You are my world, a vessel for my love, my prosperity, my future, and I hope to be a vessel for you, a provider, an abundant source of wealth, joy, and love. I love you, Noah. Okay, I slowly replied, smiling uncertainly at Abigail's speech. Are you just trying to delay saying I do? The crowd laughed, and, ever the aspiring comedian, I grinned smugly. I was oblivious to the significance of the union being forged. I'm ready for your vows, Noah. 
Abigail warmly caressed my hands whilst looking at the vicar. Yes, the man stammered, dumbfounded by her vows. Right. Noah? I cleared my throat. What version of chat GPT were you using? I didn't get anything like that. My fiancée rolled her eyes and shook her head. Fine, I chuckled. I'll be serious, okay? I summoned a deep breath, unmasking the clown to reveal a vulnerable man beneath. Abigail, there is no other woman quite like you, I said. From the moment we met, I was drawn to you, the only person goofier than me. I knew that I had to marry you, if only to prove to my parents that, comparatively, I'm not that weird. I heard my mother and father chortling from the front row. You are boundlessly kind, intelligent, and beautiful. My one and only love, in this lifetime and any lifetime, I continued, pausing for the obligatory utterances of gooey approval from the crowd. I love you, Abigail. And do you promise to be a vessel for my love? She pressed, fidgeting on the spot. That was the only odd question which didn't surprise me. It was a vow my fiancé had requested, that we would both be love vessels for one another. Abigail had always been a poet, all teasing aside, and I viewed her entire declaration as a typical Abbey oddity. The vessel vow was no different. It was just her unusual form of love language. Something sort of innuendo, perhaps, I thought, stifling a grin. I promise to be a vessel for your love, I agreed. Once the words escaped my lips, I immediately caught a glimpse of something in Abigail's eye. The fleeting reflection of a shadow in the corner of the church. It had the shape of a man, a misshapen man, and it came with the sensation of my brain being painfully clamped. Only for a moment, but long enough to make me wince. Noah, the vicar asked, noticing my brief flinch. I'm fine, I muttered, shaking my head to free the pins and needles. Abigail smiled, but it was a faux smile not the adoring one I'd come to know over the years. It is time for the declaration of intent. Do you, Noah Chapman, take Abigail Thorpe to be your lawfully wedded wife? The vicar asked. I do, I said, eye twitching as I wrestled with what felt like ethereal fingernails digging into my skull. And do you, Abigail Thorpe, take Noah Chapman to be your lawfully wedded husband? The vicar asked. I do, my fiancé nodded, lips bending ever upwards. Then by the power vested in me, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride, the vicar said. The crowd roared with applause as my mouth met Abigail's pursed lips. Much like her smile, much like that entire ceremony, it was nothing like any other kiss we'd shared. I had never felt both warm and cold from her touch. I'd never felt that way from anything. It was the happiest moment of my life, yet it was clouded by trepidation, a clinging fear. But what followed was not horror. My wife and I began a whirlwind romance, a relationship deeper than the one we had prior to marrying. That swiftly flushed any doubts down the drain. The slight blip on our wedding day must have been jitters. That was what I chose to believe, a cliché but one that made the most sense. The first bump in the road came a month down the line. The topic of our living situation arose for the hundredth time. From her late parents, Abigail inherited the family home and a sizable plot of land. She wanted us to move there. Understandable, of course. However, I resented the idea of her relatives viewing me as a gold digger. Her great-aunt once made a chastising remark that stuck with me. Everybody knows the Thorpe name, she huffed to Abigail. I've got my eye on you, Chapman. The implication infuriated me. I was already financially stable before meeting Abigail. I worked as a senior software engineer. I didn't need the Thorpe fortune. The house is yours, I told my wife. Do what you want with it, but don't feel that you have to include me. It's your inheritance. I'd rather not move into that place. Abigail groaned. Stop being so stubborn, Noah. It's not a handout, okay? We're married. What's mine is yours. Well, what about Chris? I pointed out. Isn't he interested in it? Does he not resent your parents for leaving the estate to you? He inherited a sizable sum of money, the yacht, and the lake house, Abigail said. My brother received just as much wealth as me. Does he see it that way? I asked. After all, we are talking about Thorpe Manor. That's your family's heritage. Heritage? Oh, please. Chris only cares about money, my wife laughed. You need to get over this, Noah. Nobody is going to despise you for living in that house with me. Forget my great-aunt Gertrude. She's a bitter old woman. An aunt, might I add, who my mother hated. 
Arguing with Abigail was like chewing skirt steak. It was tough, and it ended with jaw ache. Naturally, I eventually buckled and agreed to move to Thorpe Manor. In fairness, Abigail was right. I was being stubborn. I admit my flaws. Pride is one of them. In truth, I did want to move there. The property was one of unbeatable splendor, and I was secretly jubilant at the prospect of living in a manor. Marital bliss resumed. All seemed well for the following few months, better than ever before, as I said. I forgot all about the argument and the strangeness of our wedding day. And then came the migraines. Much like the day of the ceremony, electric shocks filled my head. Brain zaps. They flared up during the mornings, mostly, but the dull pain sometimes persisted throughout the day. And there were other health issues. No matter how much I slept, I was perpetually fatigued, hazy-brained, living life on standby mode. It felt as if I were lugging a plumper brain around to the detriment of my thinking ability. And that was strange as I'd never been the type to feel excessively tired. I was a night owl, but suddenly I seemed unable to stay awake past ten in the evening, and nothing noticeable in my lifestyle had changed. Are you okay, sweetie? Abigail asked. I sighed heavily. I just, um, I feel tired, my wife finished. Lie down for a little while, honey. I'll cook dinner tonight. No, I said I'd do it. Don't you have to prepare for that presentation in the morning? I asked. But Abigail shushed me, and I thanked her, giving her a tight squeeze. Then I waddled dozily to the manor's spacious lounge, picking one of the three sofas to rest my weary, weighty head. I slumped onto a cushion, and my body tumbled immediately into the land of Nod. But my dreams were feverish, the eccentric, surreal nightmares of a body running on fumes. When the body viciously reboots itself after countless sleepless nights, the mind runs wild. And this wasn't my first fever dream since moving to the manor. Just as it wasn't the first time I'd seen the man in the corner of my sleep-fueled visions. The man with gray eyes and no other features on his face. I woke from my nap around half six in the evening. I'm sure I would have slept until dinner was ready, but the sound of an agitated conversation disrupted my rest. You need to leave, Abigail urged. It's far too early for you to be. He's asleep, a man's familiar voice interrupted. Let's do it now. I'm growing impatient. No, dinner's nearly ready, my wife huffed. He'll be waking up soon. There'll be time later. Fine, a woman grunted. At the midpoint, then. At the midpoint, Abigail said. I squeezed my eyelids together, body trembling as I tried to decipher the coded conversation. I was racking my brain to pinpoint those voices. I was distracted during dinner. I wanted to confront Abigail about the mysterious visitors who left before I pretended to wake up. Of course, she would have known that I'd been eavesdropping. And something about the nature of their talk set me on the back foot. I felt exposed. Abigail had never made me feel exposed before. When we finally went to bed, I stayed awake with my eyes firmly shut. I anxiously awaited whatever scheme Abigail and her unknown accomplice had in store. I channeled my inner night owl, and I wasn't worried about nodding off. Nerves will keep me awake, I decided as would the thunderstorm which brewed outside. However, I was baffled to be woken by my alarm clock around seven in the morning. I'd failed to resist the pull of sleep, and the sinister connotations of that fact were starting to dawn on me. The exhaustion, the excruciating headaches, the strangers in our home. Something was uneven. And on this particular morning there was something else. The legs of my joggers were dirty and sodden. Have I been sleepwalking outside, I wondered. I wasn't convinced, so I resisted the urge to mention anything to Abigail. It was all connected somehow. My wife had something to do with it, and I devised a way to find answers. I would film myself, see whether I'd been getting up in the middle of the night, going for strolls, repeatedly bludgeoning my head, perhaps. There had to be a logical explanation for everything, even the conversation— you might have misinterpreted or misheard them, I suggested to myself. Or better yet, it may have been a dream. With renewed confidence, I crossed my fingers that the video footage would clear up everything. After setting up the camera, I went to bed with giddiness in my gut. I longed to wake and finally have some answers. Unfortunately, the next day there were no damp patches or grubby stains on my clothes. And the video recording revealed that I slept through the night. 
Over the following days, this continued to be the case. I was starting to lose faith until Chris came to stay. Much to my annoyance, Abigail's drunken brother, upon arriving at our manor, collapsed on the sofa. He won a sizable sum of money from gambling and immediately splurged it on a two-day bender. It wasn't the first time that he'd earned and blown wealth. Is this going to be a recurring thing? I sighed. My wife shrugged. He's an addict, Noah. We have to support him. He's working on it. Maybe he's also a sociopath, I said, and he never has to account for his actions. Abigail pouted. Look, he's still my brother. Besides, he actually came here to clear his head. Right, I nodded disbelievingly, rubbing my own pounding forehead. Speaking of which, the migraines are back. I'm going to bed. Okay, sweetie, my wife said, planting a kiss on my sore brow. Good night. The next morning I woke to that familiar feeling of disorientation, and for the first time I was glad about it. I knew exactly what it meant. I rushed to my computer, uploaded the footage from the hidden camera, and fast-forwarded through the events of the prior night. What the... I began. At midnight, Abigail's eyes opened fully. She lay on her back as stiff as a plank, as if she'd never really been asleep, as if she were hardly human for that matter. My wife rose like a machine, and her stiff limbs carried her to the bedroom door. When she opened it, Chris entered. It's time. Is he ready? My brother-in-law asked. Abigail nodded. Good, the man replied before clearing his throat. At the midpoint, you unglue. In a blur of motion too fast to track, something awful happened. My body split in two. Abigail and Chris watched silently as my sleepwalking form rose from the bed, unbinding itself from the black, shadowy shape of a body left on the bed. My real-life jaw fell. I watched as my wife and brother-in-law walked out of the room, followed by my zombified body. And left behind, there was only a black spectral form atop the bed, a shadow that had my vague shape. It was a vibrating energy with my outline rigidly frozen in place. Hyperventilating, mind crippled by existential dread, I shivered in front of the computer screen, watching an unmoving recording of some terrifying spirit. After half an hour, Abigail and Chris returned, followed seconds later by my shuffling, lifeless shell. Are you satisfied? My wife asked Chris. Never, her brother coldly replied. Are you? Yes, my wife said, tucking my body back into bed. It lay atop the black spirit. Then why do you do the same? Chris asked, offering a wicked smile. Abigail ignored him. I am a vessel for your love. You glue. With those words, the dark specter reunited with my body. Skin absorbed the blackened form. A second later, after rebinding, my recorded self started snoozing soundly. I love him, my wife said. You love what he can give you, my brother-in-law taunted. Good night, Abby. After her brother left the room, Abigail stood in silence for several minutes. She stared at the wall, panting heavily. I don't know what she felt. Rage, sadness, frustration. All I know is that her breathing suddenly slowed, until she looked entirely peaceful, serene. And then her head cracked to the side, facing the filming camera. Fuck, I cried, falling off the desk chair, and, as I climbed to my feet, my eyes were drawn to the shape in the office's doorway. Abigail was home. I've been waiting for you to wake up, she sighed. Noah, I can explain. What the fuck, Abigail? I screamed. What the fucking fuck? I didn't know how to tell. I'm leaving, I cried, charging towards the stranger in the doorway. Day or night, heed your vow, she whispered. In a surge of excruciating agony, I felt my body tear in two, and by the time I realized that, I was left staring at my own physical form. It stood before me like a statue. I was a disembodied spirit, enduring a terrifying outer body experience. Don't worry, Abigail said, leaving my frozen spirit behind as she led my physical shell out of the room. I'll fix you. As my wife and my body exited the office, the colors of reality swirled around me and I stumbled into a liminal landscape of brimstone and hellfire. Strangely, I recognized it. Something stirred in my memory bank. I'd been to that place before, numerous times, every time the Thorpe split my soul from its vessel, and when I woke, I forgot. I was left with nothing but a pounding head and questions. I decided that time would be different. Hello? I called. I wandered through the arid abyss, 
tentatively peering around rocky mounds and sidestepping trickling streams of fire, lava, or whatever otherworldly substance blazed in that wasteland. The sky above was black, but it was not filled with stars. It was an infinite emptiness, not a sky at all, not anything. After what could have been an hour or a minute of wandering through nothingness, I eventually abandoned my mission and resigned myself to Abigail's fate. With a deep sigh, I turned my head and prepared to head back. My feet failed me. Following at a distance of no more than ten yards was a looming, gangly figure. A man with limbs like those of a human, but there was nothing about him that was from our world. He was built of loose, peeling flesh, revealing mounds of black, beating mush beneath the surface of his skin. And as a flare of otherworldly lava lit the air, it illuminated patches of fur on his body. Much like the man of my nightmares, he bore two gray eyes and no other features on his terrifying face. You return to the place between Noah Chapman, the being lowly noted, speaking from all directions. I shuddered, stumbling backwards. Yet again you have forgotten my face, he said, tilting his horrid head to the side and eagerly viewing me. Perhaps if I wear your lovely skin you might recognize me. The creature took a silent step towards me and I wondered whether it had been soundlessly pursuing me for the entire time I'd been in its ungodly land. Terrified of the impossibility before me, I stepped backwards, but the being was nimble, large, omnipotent in its realm, I had no doubt. What do you want? I asked. No, he replied, inching ever closer. You should be asking what they want. I panted fearfully, retreating slowly from the approaching abhorrence. Its eyes glistened a muted gray, swirling in endless whirlpools that threatened to consume me. What have they done to me? I asked. Where am I? Better questions, the creature replied. They tied you to Abigail and they are using you. As for this realm, you are in the place between places. I clawed my head frightfully. Using me for what? To claim their rewards, he hissed. No souls can step over the border and enter my prison, but a soulless body safely walks through the fire. It can do their bidding. But I have a soul, and I'm here, I pointed out. This isn't my prison, it replied. This isn't anywhere. Neither of us are really here because there is no here. What do you mean, I cried. You always ask that question. I tire of explaining this, it growled. I am Temnor, and I offer gifts to those who sustain me, Noah Chapman. The hovel by the lake. That is the place in which I have dwelled for fifty rounds of the sun. The Thorps imprisoned me, and now they feed me. You are my feast. You made a deal with the Thorps? I asked. I must survive, Temnor answered. I cannot live in a cage. The Thorps bring me your soulless body. They unglue your spurt from it, bringing me an empty husk, a shell through which I can walk the mortal world for a half hour at the midpoint. In return I give them whatever they desire, one gift per visit. You've possessed me, I whispered. People cannot be possessed, Noah Chapman. Temnor explained. You are not your body. I gasped fearfully, and an unthinkable question spilled out of my mouth. Would you make a deal with me? The terrifying being finally stopped taking strides towards me. He surveyed me with great interest, crinkling his featureless face in a way that almost had the appearance of a direful smile. You have never asked that before, Noah Chapman, it replied. What manner of deal? I want, I stammered, searching for the words. I want freedom from the Thorps. Freedom from you, this place, all of it. And in return, it asked, if not your body, I require something else. I gulped. I don't have the stomach to sacrifice another human to you, even a cruel one. Oakwood, Temnor said. I paused. Oakwood? Yes, it continued. The Thorps denied my request. I do not need much, just a taste. Why? I cautiously asked. It will unbind me from my prison, Temnor said, and they do not wish to unbind me. They need me, endlessly, again and again, for all of their selfish desires. I won't imprison you, I replied. I only need one thing from you. We need the same thing, it seems, Temnor noted. Freedom, such sickly poetry. I am curious, however. Why haven't you ever fetched Oakwood for yourself, I asked. You've used my body as a vessel to leave your hovel on numerous occasions. I am bound by rules, the being hissed. Do we have a deal, Noah Chapman? Yes, won't I forget this, I asked. As we speak, Abigail's taking my body to the lake. Yes, Temnor said. I sense her nearing. 
I shall have to leave this purgatory, and as she always does, she will ask that I make you forget. Will you bring me the oak wood if I lie? I shuddered and nodded. By the midpoint, it continued. I nodded again. Very well, Temnor growled. I will ensure that you remember. I screamed as my soul was swept away by a swirl of blackness in which the horrifying entity merged with its surroundings. After an eternal plummet, I felt grounded, physical, real, and I realized that the blackness was, in fact, the inside of my eyelids. When I opened them, my soul had returned to its body. I was back in the real world, lying in bed, in the real time, not the one between. Good morning, a peppy voice called, startling me. I turned to face the ensuite door, and my wife was beaming at me with a toothbrush in her mouth. She asked Temnor to wipe my mind, and I had to play along with that notion. It took tremendous willpower, but I smiled. Morning, I croakily replied. Well, afternoon, actually, my wife chuckled. How's your head feeling? Better, now you've slept it off? Strangely, I did feel better. I wondered whether Temnor's induced amnesia had been giving me the migraines. I also realized that it was the same day. Hours had passed, but Abigail was simply pretending nothing had happened. And when I looked to the hiding spot on a nearby shelf, I noticed my camera wasn't there. She asked him to make me forget about filming myself, too, I realized. What do you want to do today? Abigail asked. It's the weekend, at long last. Yeah, well, firstly, I'm going to take my morning walk, I quickly responded. My wife frowned slightly, but her face quickly eased and she nodded. Fortunately, I did like to stroll around the property every morning, so there was nothing out of the ordinary about that. What had clearly aroused suspicion was the fact that my voice had been filled with such urgency. Before Abigail had the opportunity to piece anything together, I was already out of the house, and I beelined straight for the car. I knew of a nearby road lined with oak trees, and all Temnor needed was a sliver of wood. The smallest amount, and he would be free. I would be free and as I pulled down the driveway, I took a quick glance in my rearview mirror. Abigail was standing on the front steps. Shit, I whispered, flooring the pedal. She knew I was lying. She could read my face, and I knew that she was smart enough to figure out what that meant. But it was fine. I got away. In fact, I should never return, I thought. She can't have my body if I run. She can, Temnor's unmistakable voice whispered. Wherever you go, she can summon your vessel at the midpoint. I shrieked fearfully at the sudden sound in my head, and my eyes were drawn to the property's passing lake. It lay just beyond a small cluster of trees, the small forest, and my body drained of all warmth when I spotted a lurking shape in the pines, long-limbed, gray-eyed, and not quite human. Casting my eyes back to the road, I floored the accelerator and slipped through the manor's main gates. As I drove along the road of trees I had in mind, my mind raced with the possibilities of what my treacherous wife might be doing to reclaim control of my body. After mounting a grassy bank at the foot of some oaks, I retrieved a penknife from the glove compartment. I was thankful that we'd been on a recent camping trip, and I flew out of the car scrambling up the hill to reach the nearest tree. With a swift flick of my tool I had shaved a thin layer of wood from a mighty oak beside the road. I did not hesitate to jump back into the car and head home. When I returned, however, the atmosphere of the manor felt different. I trundled tentatively through the main gates and dreaded what I might find at the lake. Abigail and Chris armed to the teeth, ready to massacre me on the spot. But finding nothing was worse. I didn't know what my wife might be planning. I drove onto the grass, heading towards the trees which formed a barrier between the property and the lake. That was when I saw them, four figures standing in a small clearing before the water. Is that Mr. and Mrs. Thorpe, I wondered? How on earth the matriarch and patriarch of the family had returned to life, I did not know. They were watching my car hesitantly approach. They're going to take you, Temnor whispered in my mind. Petrified, I felt the yank of my body splitting from my soul, and I brought the car to a halt and I watched as my mindless vessel of a body clambered out of the vehicle, walking across the grass towards the demented family waiting by the lake, waiting by Temnor's prison. Reality swirled once more, throwing me into the place between places, the nightmarish, darkened world of lava and terror. The horrifying being spoke from between two rock faces. You failed, Noah Chapman, 
and now they have claimed you as a vessel once more. Is my body in your prison? I asked. The being paused. Yes, I am about to utilize your vessel to the front pocket of my coat, I whispered. Temnor's eyes glazed as if he were viewing something in the real world. Oakwood, I see. Your contract will be nullified, Noah Chapman. By the power vested in me, I unbind you from Abigail Chapman. I unbind you from the Thorps. As the world around me collapsed, so too did my spirit. It stretched into the endless abyss of blackness above me, and I woke on my knees in a dirt clearing by the lake, surrounded by a small cluster of trees that the Thorps called a forest. Beneath me there lay a downward muddy slope concealed by shrubbery and trees, the place that had been Temnor's jail for an untold length of time. Before me I saw the line which marked the edge of his domain, but I was within it. No soul can step within my prison. But I wasn't burning alive. I could tread across his land. It was no longer his prison. I had freed him. I ran through the trees, ignoring the early evening sun that slipped behind the Thorpe Manor. I was free, spiritually, but I had free myself of that wretched family physically. I jumped in my car, still sitting with an open driver's door on the grass. But it wasn't the only car around. A hundred yards towards the house, Chris's Ford GT was crumpled like paper in the front wall of Thorpe Manor. I wanted to escape, but I had to know, had to be certain. I drove back to the property, getting out of the vehicle and lighting my way with a phone torch. And there, sitting in a bloody mess behind the wheel, was Abigail's baby brother. Chris Thorpe was flattened like a revolting omelet between the mangled seat and the bonnet. What was left of the bonnet? His beloved car. One of the gifts Temnor had no doubt given. Shaking, I found my feet moving towards the front door. I entered the well-lit property on janky legs and found a scene of utter chaos. Overturned furnishings, scratched walls, and demolished decor. In the living room I found two people I never expected to see again. Two people I scarcely believed I'd seen earlier. Miranda and Harold, the late Thorpe parents. They had once more become lifeless corpses. Harold lay on his back, belly bulging and eyes bloodshot. Gold medallions were spilling out of his mouth. As I leaned more closely, eyeing the edge of particularly blood-stained right eye, I caught sight of what seemed to be a rotund shape squeezing into his eye socket. His entire body had been filled to the brim with coins, the wealth he no doubt acquired through sordid means. And Miranda lay beside him, her body compressed into a gut-spilling mess. She had been constricted by the lavish dress she wore, a dress stained red and somehow not torn at the seams. It had torn her at the seams. Abigail, I muttered. She was the real reason I returned. In spite of the horror she and her family had inflicted upon me, I still loved the woman. I still had to know what became of her. Temnor had slaughtered the others. I knew he wouldn't have spared her, and when I reached our upstairs bedroom, my suspicions were confirmed. However, the scene was not what I expected. My wife was still alive, but horribly so. In our bed, Abigail lay in a wheezing state. She had aged beyond the years of any mortal being, aged beyond comprehension, to the extent that it seemed cruel for Temnor to keep her alive, a punishment worse than anything the others had experienced. Noah, my wife whispered, struggling to breathe with withered lungs and a crumbling body. When I walked to Abigail's bedside, I was scarcely brave enough to touch her, fearing that she might become an ashy mound in my fingers. Why did you do this? I asked. My wife tearfully mumbled. I didn't wish for cruel things, Noah. You have to. You did a monstrous thing to me, I interrupted. You stole my body, my soul, made me a pawn that you could throw into the lion's den. Money that Dad spent poorly, pretty things that turned Mom cold and callous. Successful investments that Chris squandered on hedonism and cruelty to others. She coughed. But I only wanted to bring them back. Mom and Dad. And then I... Well, I wanted you to love me forever. I wanted us to be together forever. Wanted you to love me unconditionally. I was greedy, too. This is his punishment. Killing me with age and heartbreak. That's a lot of wants, Abigail, I whispered bitterly. And they came at the expense of me. No, it... It wasn't going to hurt you, Abigail whispered, eyes fading. Look what it did to all of you, I said. I only pray it upholds its end of the bargain. My wife's eyes widened. 
What did you say? Bargain? Did you strike a deal with Temnor? Did you free it? She gasped near soundlessly, barely clutching to life. I nodded. After you imprisoned him. Imprisoned him? Abigail shuddered. Is that what he told you? We found him, Noah, locked away in the hovel. Somebody put him there long ago for good reason. You, somebody else. I don't really care, Abigail, I sighed. This was the only way to free myself. My wife produced a single tear, all she had left to give. May something have mercy on your soul, Noah, for there is certainly no God left. This is Temnor's domain now. As my wife faded into the pit of emptiness we all find at the end of the road, I reflected on her dying words. What use would there be in lying to me? Over the many weeks following her death I keep wondering what she meant. Should I not have freed Temnor? I know what he craved within his prison. What does he crave beyond it? As the first light of dawn touches the rugged landscape of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, I stand among my fellow rangers at the base camp, the chill of the morning mingling with a sense of anticipation. My name's Koa. I'm a park ranger who's walked these trails and climbed these ridges more times than I can count. Today, though, the familiar terrain feels different, shadowed with uncertainty. Eh, Koa, you all right, brah? A voice asks, pulling me back to the present. I turn to see Lilani, a fellow ranger and my best friend since we were knee-high to a grasshopper. Lani's always been the kind of person who lights up a room, or in this case, the dense forest of the national park. Her hair, a cascade of dark brown curls, is pulled back into a practical ponytail. Her almost jet-black eyes, sharp and alert, missing nothing, scan me for any sign of distress. I nod, forcing a half-smile. Yeah, you know me, sister. I'm solid. Just got a feeling, you know? My gaze drifts over the expanse of the park, the volcanic land that's part of my soul. Lani leans in, her voice lowering to a whisper. I feel it, too. Something's off today. For real? I ask. Yeah, this morning as I wake up, I see. Her voice trails off as she glances around, ensuring no one else is within earshot. She leans in so close I can hear the breath of her whisper. I saw something weird by the old lava flow, like shadows moving, not normal. Before she can elaborate, Captain Corsero, a robust figure with years of experience etched into his weathered face, calls the team to attention. His gruff voice cuts through the morning chill. Standing tall and imposing, he gathers us in a semicircle. Listen up, everybody, he begins, his gravelly voice carrying through the crisp morning air. Last night, the Geological Survey detected unusual volcanic activities on Kilauea. Increased seismic activity and gas emissions suggest that something's brewing beneath the surface. A collective murmur of concern ripples through the group. Mount Kilauea, one of the most active volcanoes on Earth, is a sleeping giant that we respect and fear in equal measure. Looks like Pele is stirring, Lonnie mutters, referring to the Hawaiian goddess of volcanoes and fire. Her tone is one of reverence. There's more, the team leader continues. We've got a missing persons report, a family of Haoles. A woman named Sarah Jenkins and her two young boys, Tyler and Ethan, went for a hike yesterday near the Chain of Craters Road and haven't returned. Lani and I exchange glances. The Chain of Craters Road area is vast and can be treacherous, even for seasoned professionals, let alone tourists from the mainland. It's our job to locate them, Corsero says. We'll split into teams to cover more ground. He unfolds a map, pointing to various locations. We all huddle around to study the map. Saito, he calls out, staring at me. You're with Lennox. He shifts his gaze to Lani. Start at the Kalapana Trail and work your way north. Keep your radios on and report anything out of the ordinary. As Corsero's orders sink in, a flurry of activity erupts among the rangers. The normally serene morning at the park transforms into a hive of focused urgency. Each ranger, aware of the gravity of the situation, springs into action. I turn to gather my equipment. As a seasoned tracker, my backpack is filled with essentials, a GPS, a detailed topographical map of the park, high-powered binoculars, and various other tools for navigating and surviving in rugged terrain. Beside me, Lani, a skilled technical rescue expert, meticulously checks her gear, 
ensuring that everything is in perfect condition for whatever complex rescue scenarios we might encounter in the park's challenging terrain. Her bag is filled with specialized equipment, ropes, pulleys, carabiners, and safety harnesses. As I strap my boots tightly, ensuring they are fit, I glance at Lonnie. She catches my eye, offering a nod of solidarity. What do you think, Koa? She asks quietly, her voice tinged with the unspoken worry we all feel. You reckon we'll find them? I pause, adjusting the strap of my pack. In moments like these, it's not just about what you say, but how you say it. Confidence can be as contagious as fear in these situations. You forget who you're talking to, I say with a half-smirk, trying to lighten the mood. I'm the best tracker on the big island. If they're out there, we'll find them. She gives a small laugh, the tension in her shoulders easing ever so slightly. That's what I like to hear. Let's bring them home. The early morning light filters through the dense canopy as we load the Land Rover, casting a soft glow on the rugged terrain of the park. The engine roars to life and we head towards the search area. As I navigate the familiar route towards the Kalapana Trail, the connection I feel to this land pulsates through me. This place, with its rugged beauty and untamed wilderness, has been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. It's more than just a job. It's a calling, a deep-rooted bond with the land that nurtures and challenges me in equal measure. Lonnie, sitting beside me, is lost in her own thoughts as we pass our old stomping grounds. Growing up, we spent countless summers exploring the hidden corners of this paradise, from diving into the crystal-clear waters of hidden coves to racing each other up the ancient lava trails. The closer we get the base of Kilauea, the more evident the signs of recent volcanic activity become. Thin wisps of steam rise from cracks in the ground, a stark reminder of the raw power beneath our feet. Look at that, Lonnie murmurs, her eyes fixed on a newly formed fissure, its edges blackened and sharp. The earth here seems alive, breathing and shifting with a life of its own. The beauty of it is both mesmerizing and unsettling. I pull the vehicle over and we step out cautiously, scanning the area. The ground feels unusually warm under our boots. This wasn't here last week, I note, my voice low. The fresh lava flow, now solidified, creates an eerie, undulating terrain that stretches towards the horizon. We proceed with increased vigilance, knowing that the volcanic activity could pose a hazard not just to the missing family but also to us. Paths that were safe yesterday might not be today. Our eyes scour every inch of the terrain, searching for any clue that might lead us to the missing family. The silence is heavy, broken only by the occasional crackle of our radios and the distant rumble of the volcano. Suddenly I spot something unusual in the distance. It's a small, dark object, partially obscured by the rough, newly solidified lava. Over there, I gesture to Lani, pointing towards the object. Reaching the spot, a chill runs down my spine. It's a camera, half buried in the hardened lava. The lens is melted, warped by the intense heat, but the body of the camera is mostly intact. It's disturbing evidence that the family we're looking for might have been caught in the lava flow. Moving cautiously over the rough terrain, we soon come across more signs of the family's presence. A torn piece of a map flutters against a jagged rock, and an aluminum water bottle, its logo partially melted, lies discarded nearby. Lonnie kneels down, her hands carefully sifting through the ash and debris. The somber mood intensifies as she uncovers a small backpack, partially buried and singed at the edges. It's a vivid red against the monochrome landscape of black and gray. My heart sinks a bit more with each brush of her hand, revealing the harsh reality of our mission. She looks up at me, her eyes reflecting sorrow. It's one of the kids' backpacks, she says quietly, holding it up. The name Ethan is embroidered in bold letters on the back. I crouch beside Lani, examining the backpack. Inside, there are remnants of a child's adventure, a crumpled map of the park, a small toy car, and a half-eaten snack bar. Everything is coated with a thin layer of ash. Lani carefully logs the coordinates of our discovery on the GPS. She then radios back to base, her voice steady but tinged with the gravity of our find. Base, this is Ranger Lennox. We found some items belonging to the missing family near a new lava flow. We're going to continue searching the area. As she communicates with the base, I can't shake a gut feeling that there's more to this. I decide to extend our search perimeter.
The landscape around us is treacherous, a labyrinth of hardened lava and jagged rocks. Despite the weight of what we've already discovered, something urges me on. It's just a hunch, but hunches have always served me well in the past. The air is thick with the heat emanating from the ground, and the smell of sulfur hangs heavily around us. It's a surreal landscape, one that's both beautiful and brutal in its raw, natural power. Then I see something that stops me in my tracks. There, in the middle of a large expanse of cooled lava, are footprints. Not just any footprints, but what appears to be a set of bare human footprints. These impressions in the hard, black surface look as if they were made when the lava was still molten, an impossibility for any living being to survive. I crouch down for a closer look, trying to make sense of what I'm seeing. The footprints are unmistakably human, each toe defined, the arch of a foot clearly visible. They lead away from the area where we found the camera and the backpack, weaving through the rough terrain. Lonnie, I call out, my voice barely above a whisper, not wanting to believe what I'm seeing. She finishes her transmission and hurries over, her expression turning to one of disbelief as she takes in the sight. How is this even possible? She murmurs, echoing my thoughts. We gingerly follow the tracks. The trail of footprints leads us further away from the barren lava field, towards a region where the volcanic devastation blends back into the lush greenery of the park. The footprints become less distinct on the softer ground, but we continue, guided by broken twigs and disturbed earth. We push forward, our senses heightened. The forest around us is alive with the sounds of nature, but to our trained ears it's what's not heard that speaks louder. The usual chatter of birds and rustle of small creatures seems muted, as if the forest itself is holding its breath. Then, through the dense undergrowth, I catch a glimpse of something unusual. It's a figure, humanoid in shape, but its movements are odd, almost erratic. The figure is covered in what looks like volcanic ash, giving it an eerie, ghost-like appearance. I instinctively reach out, gently touching Lani's arm to draw her attention. My gesture is subtle, a silent communication perfected over years of working together in these unpredictable environments. We both freeze, our bodies tensing as we observe the figure through the thick foliage. Lani's eyes meet mine, a mixture of confusion and caution reflected in her gaze. With a slight nod, we agree to approach carefully, mindful of the potential risks. The figure moves with an uncanny grace, almost floating across the forest floor. Its movements are fluid yet disjointed, creating an unreal image against the backdrop of the green forest. As we inch closer, the air around us grows noticeably hotter, a stifling heat that seems to radiate from the figure itself. The ground beneath its feet is scorched, leaving a trail of smoldering embers and blackened earth in its wake. The underbrush, parched from the recent dry weather conditions, catches fire at the slightest touch of the entity's burning footsteps. The intensity of the heat emanating from the figure is like nothing I've ever experienced. It's as if the very essence of the volcano's core is encapsulated within this being. The dry underbrush ignites with alarming speed, the flames spreading rapidly through the dense vegetation. Lani and I exchange a look of alarm, realizing the danger we're in. The fire, spurred on by the hot, dry winds, quickly becomes a roaring blaze, consuming everything in its path. The forest around us transforms into a fiery hellscape within moments. The heat is suffocating, the air thick with smoke and the crackling of flames. We're forced to retreat, but the fire spreads with terrifying speed, cutting off our usual paths. Every direction seems to lead further into an inferno. We scramble over the rough terrain, the heat so intense it feels like our lungs are burning with each breath. We're both seasoned rangers, but this is beyond anything we've ever faced. I grab Lonnie's arm, pulling her away from a falling, flaming branch. We're running blind through the smoke, relying on instinct and our deep knowledge of the park's landscape. The visibility is near zero, the air a swirling mass of embers and ash. We stumble upon a narrow ravine, the only viable path away from the flames. The ground is uneven, treacherous with loose rocks and steep drops. We navigate it as quickly as we can, but it's like moving through molasses. Lani coughs violently, her face smeared with soot. I can see the fear in her eyes, a mirror of my own terror. Keep moving, I shout, more to convince myself than her. 
The heat is relentless, an oppressive force that seems to press down on us from all sides. I can feel my skin burning, the heat searing through my clothes. My throat is parched, each breath a scorching gulp of hot air. Suddenly a loud crack resonates through the air and a tree collapses mere feet in front of us, blocking our path. The flames leap higher, fed by the fresh fuel. I frantically look for a way around, but the fire is closing in. In a desperate move, I lead us down a steep embankment, sliding and tumbling over rocks and debris. Lonnie follows without hesitation, trusting my lead. We land hard at the bottom, but there's no time to recover. We have to keep moving. Finally, after what feels like an eternity, we emerge from the smoke and flames, gasping for air. The world outside the fire zone seems eerily calm, as though unaware of the chaos we just escaped. We stumble back to our Land Rover, the vehicle a welcoming sight amidst the devastation. Climbing in, I start the engine and we drive away from the inferno, putting distance between us and the haunting image of the fiery figure in the blazing forest. Lonnie, still coughing from the smoke inhalation, manages to grab the radio and report back to base. Her voice is hoarse but urgent as she relays the situation. Base, this is Lennox. We've got a wildfire situation. The area around the Calapana Trail is engulfed. We need immediate backup and fire containment units. The radio crackles to life, and Captain Corsero's voice comes through, tense and authoritative. Copy that, Lennox. We're mobilizing units now. Get to safety and stand by for further instructions. As I navigate the Land Rover through the park's winding paths, my mind races with thoughts of the figure we encountered. I glance over at Lonnie. She's deep in thought, her eyes distant. What was that thing? I ask, my voice barely above a whisper. The image of the fiery figure moving through the forest with an otherworldly grace is seared into my mind. She doesn't answer immediately, her gaze fixed on the passing landscape. Finally, she turns to me, her expression serious. I think it was a lava walker, she says. Lava walker, I repeat, unfamiliar with the term. It sounds like something out of a myth or a horror story. Yeah, I just made it up, Lonnie admits, a slight shrug accompanying her words. It's like a skinwalker, but for volcanoes. Seriously, Lonnie, come on. I can't help but let out a skeptical laugh. Lonnie gives me a look, one that's both challenging and serious. Okay, wise guy, you come up with a better explanation. What else could it have been? I open my mouth to retort, but the words falter on my lips. I... I don't know, I finally confess, the words tasting like defeat. The more I think about it, the more I realize that there are things in this world that defy conventional understanding. As we approach the rendezvous point... The distant wail of sirens grows louder, slicing through the tense silence inside the vehicle. The sight that greets us is a flurry of activity. Fire containment units, park rangers, and emergency vehicles converge at the edge of the expanding wildfire. Captain Corsairo stands in the midst of it all, a commanding presence as he directs the operations. His face is set in grim determination. As we pull up, he turns, spotting us immediately. His expression softens for a moment with relief at seeing us safe, before returning to its previous intensity. You two all right? He asks, eyeing our soot-covered faces and singed clothing. We're okay, Captain, Lonnie responds, her voice hoarse but steady. But we've got a serious situation. That fire is spreading fast and there's something... unusual about it. Unusual? He asks. I nod in agreement, still catching my breath. We saw something in the forest, sir. It's hard to explain, but it seemed to be causing the fire, moving through the trees like, like it was part of the flames. Corsero's brow furrows, a skeptical look crossing his face. Sounds like heat exhaustion, Saito. We need clear heads here. He gestures towards the medical tent. Head over to the medics. Get yourselves checked out. If you're fit, I need you back on the line. This fire's not going to control itself, and we need all hands on deck. After a brief rest and rehydration, we don our firefighting gear, feeling the weight of responsibility on our shoulders. The afternoon sky is aglow with the raging fire, casting an eerie light over the park. We join a small team of rangers and firefighters, ready to venture into the heart of the wildfire. Helicopters and drones overhead coordinate our movement, but the journey is perilous. The air is thick with smoke, reducing visibility to mere feet. The heat is stifling like walking through an open furnace. 
Embers whirl around us, carried by the hot winds, threatening to ignite anything remotely flammable. Suddenly, without warning, a massive flare-up erupts. A wall of fire explodes from the underbrush, fueled by a pocket of trapped gas. The force of the blaze is like a physical blow, knocking me off my feet. In the chaos, I'm separated from the rest of the team. I shout Lonnie's name, but my voice is lost in the cacophony of crackling flames and collapsing trees. Panic sets in as I realize I'm alone. The heat is so intense it feels like my skin is blistering through my protective gear. My breathing is the only sound that pierces the relentless roar of the flames. Each inhale and exhale echoes through my oxygen mask. The world around me is a terrifying landscape of fire and smoke. Trees, once towering and majestic, are now monstrous torches, their branches reaching out like fiery claws. I stumble over a fallen log, the wood crumbling under my weight, embers scattering like fiery rain. My heart pounds in my chest a rapid drumbeat echoing the chaos around me. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I spot a figure moving through the flames. For a moment I think it's Lonnie, but as it comes closer, I realize it's something else entirely. The figure moves with an eerie grace, untouched by the fire that rages around it. As it approaches, the air around it seems to warp and ripple, the intense heat bending light itself. The flames seem to dance around it, converging into a swirling vortex of fire and ash. Just as the figure nears, a hand grabs mine, pulling me back to the harsh reality of the firestorm. I turn to see Lonnie, her face obscured by the visor of her protective gear. For a moment in the surreal, smoky haze, she looks alien, a creature from another world in her fire-resistant suit. But it's her grip, firm and reassuring, that grounds me. Convincing me she's very much human. We can't stay here. Her voice cuts through the roaring fire. The ground under our feet shifts unpredictably. The earth cracked and uneven from the intense heat. We dodge falling branches and leap over smoldering debris, the air thick with the acrid smell of burning wood and ash. As we navigate through the inferno, trying to stay ahead of the ever-advancing flames, a haunting sound pierces through the chaos. At first it seems like another trick of the fire. A howl of the wind, perhaps, or the creaking of burning trees. But while we pause, panting and disoriented, the sound crystallizes into something unmistakably human. Voices, distant and ghostly, floating through the smoke. The voices aren't speaking in English, nor in the familiar pigeon that's like second nature to us. Instead, they're in Hawaiian, the language of our ancestors, a language we've heard in school, in cultural celebrations, but never fully mastered. Despite our limited understanding, the tone of desperation is unmistakable. Their cries for help, the voices haunting and persistent, draw us like a siren's call. We exchange a glance, the same thought mirrored in our eyes. We can't ignore this. We push forward towards the voices, time being our greatest enemy. The ground slopes sharply, leading to a steep ravine that cuts through the park like a scar. It's a natural barrier, one that the fire hasn't yet crossed but the flames are close, hungrily licking at its edges. Lonnie and I cautiously approach the precipice of the ravine. The voices grow louder, clearer. They seem to be emanating from the depths of the ravine itself, rising up through the billowing smoke like a chorus of lost souls. Among the ghostly voices, Lonnie catches a word that sends a shiver down our spines. Kapu, she whispers, her voice tinged with fear. The ancient Hawaiian term for forbidden or sacred reverberates through the fiery landscape, a warning unheeded by us until now. We stand frozen, the realization hitting us hard. We're on sacred ground, a place where the living are not meant to tread. The air grows heavy, charged with an otherworldly energy, as if the very spirits of the land are rising in anger against our intrusion. Suddenly, from the glow of molten rock and the charred remains of the forest, three figures emerge. At first they appear as mere distortions in the heated air, like mirages born of the fire. But as they draw closer, their forms become horrifyingly clear. The largest of the three lava walkers strides forward with a dominating presence. Its body is a living tapestry of molten rock and fire. Flames lick across its surface, outlining muscles and limbs. Its eyes, glowing like coals, fix on us with an intensity that chills me to the core. Flanking the larger figure are two smaller ones, each moving with an eerie, fluid grace. 
Their childlike size gives me an unsettling feeling. The flames that envelop them cast their features in a grotesque, ever-changing dance of light and shadow. As they draw nearer, the terrifying truth dawns on us. These creatures, these lava walkers, are the missing family we've been searching for. The largest figure, the one that resembles the mother, extends a hand towards us. Her fingers, made of flowing lava and flickering flames, reach out in a gesture that's heartbreakingly human. Her eyes, glowing embers in a face of liquid rock, convey a mother's desperation. Even with our fire-resistant gear, we can feel our skin prickling painfully from the proximity. We back away slowly, our eyes locked on the haunting figures before us. An invisible barrier of heat pushes us back step by step. In our haste, we don't realize how close we are to the precipice. Lonnie stumbles, her foot slipping on the loose, ashy soil. For a heart-stopping moment, she teeters on the edge, her arms flailing for balance. Acting on instinct, I lunge forward grabbing her firmly around the waist. With a desperate heave, I pull her back from the brink, both of us falling to the ground in a heap. I frantically search for any route of escape. Then my eyes catch sight of a large charred tree, its base weakened by the fire and the intense heat of the volcanic activity. I motion to Lani, pointing towards the tree. Lani, the tree! I shout over the roar of the flames. Understanding flashes in her eyes, and without another word we spring into action, I grab my chainsaw, a tool I carry for creating fire breaks. As I rev up the chainsaw, the roar of its motor cuts through the crackling of the flames, a man-made growl against nature's fury. The chainsaw bites into the charred bark, sending a shower of embers into the air. I work quickly, the blade slicing through the weakened wood, the smell of burnt timber filling my nostrils. As the tree begins to give way, Lonnie braces herself against the trunk, using all her strength to guide it in the right direction. With a final forceful push, the tree begins to topple. We both jump back as it crashes down, creating a makeshift bridge across the ravine. We scramble across the fallen tree, the wood creaking and groaning under our weight. We barely make it to the other side of the ravine when a heart-wrenching scene unfolds behind us. The earth, weakened by the intense heat and the ravages of the fire, can no longer support Lava Walker's weight. The mother, still reaching out towards us, and her two smaller companions, are swallowed by the collapsing ground. They tumble into the abyss of the ravine, their forms dissolving into the molten rock below. A profound sadness grips me as I watch them disappear. Lani grabs my arm, pulling me away from the edge. Koa, we have to keep moving, she urges, her voice thick with emotion. We move swiftly from the edge of the ravine, the heat of the inferno still pressing against our backs. Lonnie leads the way, her familiarity with the park's topography guiding us toward an elevated position, a rocky outcrop that offers a vantage point. As soon as we reach relative safety, still shaken by the harrowing sight of the lava walkers being swallowed by the earth, I pull out my radio, my hands still trembling from the intensity of what we just witnessed. I know our immediate priority is to prevent whatever is back there from spreading. Base, this is Saito. We need immediate air support on these coordinates. I relay the exact location of the ravine, emphasizing the necessity of a rapid response. The response from dispatch is swift and professional. Copy that, Saito. Air support is en route. Hang tight and stay safe. Over. Pulling off our masks, we take in deep, desperate gulps of the fresher air now available. The sensation of breathing without the constraints of our gear is profoundly relieving. As we catch our breath, a faint, distant hum grows progressively louder. I look up, straining my eyes against the smoke-filled sky. The sound intensifies, a deep, resonating thrum that vibrates through the air. I catch sight of the unmistakable silhouette of a C-130, its powerful engines cutting through the chaos of the wildfire. As the aircraft unleashes its payload onto the ravine, a cascade of fire retardant billows down in a massive cloud, blanketing the area in a surreal pink hue. The inferno below begins to subside under the deluge, the flames dampened by the torrent of chemicals. Lonnie turns to me, her eyes reflecting a myriad of emotions. My hand reaches out, gently touching her cheek, smudged with soot and sweat. You okay? I ask. Without saying a word, she pulls me close, her lips meeting mine in a passionate kiss. It's as if she's always wanted to do this. 
In the face of the unpredictable and fleeting nature of life, she seizes the opportunity, knowing it might never come again. As quickly as Lonnie kisses me, she pulls back, a flush of embarrassment coloring her cheeks. She starts to apologize, her words tumbling out in a rush. Koa, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have... I just... Before she can finish, I close the distance between us, returning her affections with equal fervor. It's a kiss filled with all the unsaid things, the emotions that have been simmering beneath the surface for far too long. The world around us seems to pause, the crackling of the fire and the distant sounds of the emergency response fading into the background. It's just Lonnie and me, surrounded by the wake of our ordeal. In the aftermath of the wildfire, the efforts of the emergency response teams gradually bring the blaze under control. The raging flames that once threatened to consume everything in their path are reduced to smoldering ashes and charred remnants. The missing Jenkins family, Sarah, Tyler, and Ethan, are officially listed as tragic victims of the fire. Within the ranks of the rangers and the emergency teams, whispers about the lava walkers circulate in hushed tones. But in the official reports, there is no mention of the mysterious figures we encountered. As the weeks pass and the charred landscape gradually begins its slow recovery, life for Lonnie and I returns to familiar rhythms, patrolling the trails, guiding tours, and educating visitors about the park's unique ecosystem and geological features. Though life has seemingly returned to its regular patterns, there's an undeniable shift between Lonnie and me that's impossible to ignore. In the quiet moments when our glances meet, there are hints of something profound and unspoken that's blossomed between us. Despite everything that unfolded, I would never discourage anyone from visiting this majestic place. Kilauea, with her raw and untamed beauty, holds a special kind of magic that everyone should witness at least once in their lifetime. So to those who wish to venture into Hawaii volcanoes, I offer these words of advice. Respect the land and heed its warnings. And if, during your journey, you ever hear the forests whispering in Hawaiian, run, aloha o. Oh. I inherited a 500-acre ranch along with 250 head of cattle out in West Texas from my great-grandfather who passed it down the line until it eventually ended up in my hands. It was his pride and joy. Growing up, he told stories of the cowboys who rode out west, settling land and setting up homes for their families. I was always awestruck at the surreal descriptions of their day-to-day -day lives and how the rugged cowpokes and the horses they rode upon were able to keep towns fed and their eventual start of rodeos and riding competitions that are still held today. Originally, my father was left with it after my grandfather had passed. He moved us into it when I was still young, along with my mother and my sisters, Allison and Angela. It was your typical ranch lifestyle growing up. My father would walk into my room at 4.30 in the morning, waking me up to go help him feed the cattle and chickens along with the other animals we had at the time. My two younger sisters eventually were brought into the loop when they were a little bit older, but were always treated like princesses. But when I failed a simple task like cleaning out the barn, there would be severe repercussions ranging from a beating with the belt to not getting dinner. But my sisters would always sneak me some food, and my mother would always try to justify why I would be the only one receiving the harsh punishments. I guess looking back on it now, I understand why he was so hard on me. We had a few extra ranch hands that helped keep everything running. I remember one of my favorite people to work with was this older, gray-haired guy called Pete. He had a thick handlebar mustache and looked like your typical cowboy. He'd always always have a cigarette between his lips and told stories about the natives that lived here long before us and the spirits that supposedly haunted the land. My father, however, didn't like it due to the fact I'd have nightmares after. But the stories were what I always looked forward to when I got out of school and done with my chores. I never really experienced any paranormal events. The only thing that I had witnessed that truly left me in complete awe was when my father and I found a mutilated heifer that was torn completely in half strung up in one of the trees out in the pasture. It wasn't uncommon to find a dead cow or two, but the way it was strung up in the tree defied all logical explanation. My father was prepping me to run the ranch as I grew older, but teenage me had different plans at the time. I had enlisted in the military my senior year of high school. This had pissed my father off so bad that he told me not to bother coming back once I had graduated boot camp. 
They were harsh words, but I was used to it. When writing home, I'd always get letters back from my mother, who would give every detail on what happened that day, or what was going on in town. It always kept me in high spirits. Before the sad events of 9-11, nothing to serious or crazy was going on in the world, and the unit I was in cleaned rifles and parking lots for the majority of the time. I remember receiving a phone call from my father the day it happened. Son, you stay safe and come back in one piece. That was the only call I received from him for the next couple of years. I had done a few tours over in the Middle East and Afghanistan before I decided to get out. In that period of time, I got married to my lovely wife Kate and had two kids of my own, two daughters, Madison and Kimberly. They grew up with their mother for the most part. It was a strained relationship thanks to the constant moving and the fact I'd be gone for six months at a time. She was left to care for them while I was gone, but we managed to make it work. She was ecstatic about the news that I was leaving the military. It was around that time I was told about my father, who was fighting stage 3 lung cancer. I packed the family up leaving North Carolina and headed down to Texas. We spent the remaining hours of my father's life by his side. We talked about the crazy experiences we'd been through and how being a parent was one of the most hardest things in life. When I was the last one in the room with him, he told me something that I didn't completely understand until now. Son, the ranch is a huge responsibility and everything you have experienced in life has led up to you taking care of it. Whatever you do, don't leave it no matter what happens, Chris. Promise me that. He spoke as tears swelled in his eyes. I promise. I held his hand. His grip was weak. It was no longer the hard and calloused, strong hands he'd worked hard with. He eventually passed, leaving behind the ranch in his will. The will stated the ranch, and its assets would go to the eldest child of the family. That happened to be me. My younger sisters didn't care much. They had moved to different states and had families of their own and were doing quite well. Everyone came down to the ranch after my father's funeral. It was a typical Texan wake. There was tons of alcohol and barbecue passed around that night in honor of the hard man that was my father, before leaving back to their homes. My sisters were the last to leave. They said their goodbyes, leaving my family alone on the 500 acres of open Texas plains. That was 12 years ago. The ranch itself consisted of a two-story house and a small living area for a few ranch hands on the eastern side of the property, as well as a large barn and a few chicken coops and a horse stable on the south side of the house. The rest was just open, arid plains filled with plenty of wildlife. I spent most of the day tending to the livestock and helping out with the repairs to the horse stable. Something had torn a few of the thick metal bars on one of the stalls from its housing. One of the ranch hands said it was some kind of dog that had done, but I just brushed it off as some wise ass telling ghost stories to the new guys, or one of the hands were baked when doing the rounds and had slammed into it with something. Take care, boss. One of the ranch hands gave me a quick wave as he headed towards a beat-up ford with the rest of the ranch hands. I'll see you all in the morning. Eat a large breakfast. We have a lot to do, I yelled towards the group. They had just gotten paid and were probably going to go spend their allowance at a bar or some casino up in Oklahoma. My two dogs, Maxime, a tan lab mix, and Zeus, a spotted border collie, ran around trying to round up a few cattle that had strayed too far from their herd as I took off my worn work gloves setting them on the hood of my old truck. Maxime, Zeus, load up. The two dogs came running over, jumping into the bed of the truck. After a few minutes of driving, I pulled up to the house. After putting the dogs up, I headed inside the house. Kate was making supper to a country tune. How's work? She asked, dancing over to me. Good. Had to fix up the horse stable. She spun back around, dancing back to the stove. Where are the kids? I asked, noticing the lack of complaints about not having good cell service. They're still cleaning out the barn and chicken coops. Honey, wake up. There's something in the barn. My wife shook me violently, waking me from a deep sleep. What? What? I blinked a few times trying to wake up. Her red hair was a mess. There's something in the barn. She hissed, clutching my wrist with a death grip. I quickly got dressed, pulling on a jacket and my old pair of work boots. I walked over to the closet, grabbing my father's lever action 30, 30, along with a flashlight. I'll go check it out. Stay inside. 
My watch showed it was 3.26 a.m. as I made my way down the hall. Dad, what was that? Madison stuck her head out of her room with a pair of headphones dangling from her neck. Go back in your room, I replied just as Kimberly exited her room. I'm scared. Her voice trembled as she walked out into the hallway. Go into your mother's room. I responded quickly. They both ran into the room talking in hushed tones as I continued down the hallway towards the stairs. Maxime and Zeus were going berserk. They were barking and straining hard against their chains trying to get to the barn. The animals we had near the house were also in a panicked state. I clicked on the flashlight. Its dull orange glow illuminated the dirt path leading towards the barn. What little remains from a few dead chickens lay in front of the, the barn feathers, and blood were soaking into the ground. Something had pulled the door open, breaking the latch, securing it shut. I raised my rifle, slowly entering the doorway. Inside were stalls lining each side of the walls, running to the back of the barn. Inside were a few dairy cows I had bought a few weeks earlier. Their distraught cries filled the barn as I made my way towards the back. As I got closer, I noticed a blood trail leading to one of the stalls. With a steady hand, I pulled the stall door open, revealing a wounded dairy cow. She had a large gash running from her hindquarter to the middle of her sternum. Her entrails hung out as she lay breathing heavily in great distress as blood began to pool around her body. I knelt down beside her, resting my rifle on the stall wall, placing my hand on her head. What did this to you, girl? I spoke quietly. Something slammed the door shut behind me, causing me to damn near jump. I scooped up my rifle and aimed it at the door. If you're out there, make yourself known or you're going to get shot, I yelled, trying to keep my composure. There was no response. I flipped the latch and swung the door open, sweeping the area for any potential threats, but only found a set of footprints in the dirt-covered floor leading back to the entrance. They looked canine in nature, but were too large to be any dog or coyote that I've ever seen. I ran back into the house, slamming the door shut and locking it. Honey, call the sheriff. I quickly made my way back to the bedroom. Kate had her phone in hand and was talking to a dispatcher. Something broke into our barn. Yes, yes, please send a deputy out as soon as possible. I grabbed my truck keys and cell phone. I'll be back. Don't let anyone inside. I grabbed the Glock 19 that I kept on the nightstand and handed it to her. What's this for? She asked, confused. Honey, something got one of the dairy cows and I think it's going to get more. They were really scared now. Don't leave, Kimberly cried. Listen, you shoot anyone that's not me or the sheriff. Don't leave the house, lock all the doors and windows. I gave Kate a quick kiss and headed back to the living room. I took Maxime and Zeus off their chains and lead them to my truck, opening the passenger door, letting them in the cab. I slid into the driver's seat and started the truck. Its large V8 engine shook the cab as it idled in the cold December air. I put the truck in drive and headed out towards the pasture to check on the livestock closest to the farmstead. After driving for a few minutes, my phone rang. It was Kate. The sheriff is on his way over. What do you want me to tell him when he gets here? Her voice was tense, I thought for a moment before answering. Tell him to meet me near the fishing pond we drink at. It's the one on the western side of the pasture. He knows what I'm talking about. There was a small moment of silence. All right, please be careful. She hung up the phone. The only sounds in the truck now were coming the two panting dogs and the low hum from the radio. After a few more minutes of driving, I arrived at the fishing pond. A large cluster of oak trees were lined near the bank on the opposite side. The headlights from my truck illuminated a small herd of cattle bunched up near the bank of the pond. They were all letting out distressed calls as they began to move towards my direction. The hackles on Zeus and Maxim's necks were sticking up. Both of them were emitting deep, guttural growls. Their eyes were focused on something off in the distance. I followed their gaze, but I couldn't see what they were seeing. I exited the truck, leaving the dogs inside with the windows cracked cautiously, making my way towards the bank. The herd was walking around me when I spotted it, two large yellow eyes piercing through the darkness at me. I glanced at one of the cattle hurrying by for a split second. It had a large chunk missing from its right flank and a large jagged claw mark running down its ribcage. The dogs were barking wildly in the truck now. As the cattle began to run in a panic, I could hear the sound of heavy footsteps getting closer and closer as I began to backpedal towards the truck. 
I could barely make the outline of it as it closed the distance on all fours. Adrenaline was burning through my veins as I raised the rifle and started firing at it. Time seemed to speed up as I cranked the lever feeding in a new round after every shot. Why the fuck did I bring a lever-action rifle? I cursed to myself for not bringing my AR as I ripped the driver's side door open trying to get in. Before I was able to get a foot in the door, Zeus and Maxime jumped out, hitting the ground running at full speed towards the creature. Get back here, I yelled to no effect as they circled the monster. It was in full view now, its figure illuminated by the headlights of my trucks. It looked like a massive humanoid dog on two feet with large, sharp claws. The creature swung at Maxim and Zeus, trying to get them to back off. Huge plumes of smoke came from its mouth and nostrils with each swing, but they didn't budge. Zeus latched onto its hind leg, causing it to let out deep cry. It swung back, its Zeus sending him tumbling off into the brush this pissed off Maxim. Maxim latched onto its left bicep, shaking his head like a deadly game of tug-of-war. I continued firing into the creature's chest before he swung Maxim into my lane of fire. I immediately stopped firing, fearing I'd shoot my dog. That's when I saw the flashing red and blue neon lights from a sheriff's vehicle bouncing off of the treetops. The creature swung at Maxim, hitting him on the side. This caused Maxim to yelp and release the creature's arm. What in God's name? The sheriff said, awestruck by the scene. Fucking shoot it. I began firing again. One of my rounds hit it in the eye, causing to stumble backwards. The sheriff began firing on it now but it seemed to make little difference as the creature got down on all fours and ran back into the darkness. When I got called out here, I wasn't expecting this. He let out a breath. A few hours later, a black SUV pulled up and two men wearing black suits asked me a series of questions regarding the event. Are you sure it wasn't a coyote? Have you been drinking this evening? Are you sure it wasn't a pack of feral hogs? I had the same response to all of their questions. No. They went on for another two hours before they finally questioned my wife and kids along with the sheriff. They took the only copy of the dash cam footage from the sheriff's truck and eventually left. A helicopter flew over the house out towards the pasture, with a huge spotlight on it circling the area for a few minutes before leaving. We sat at the dining room table near the kitchen talking about what had transpired in the past few hours. None of us could believe it. I've never seen anything like that before in my life. The sheriff exhaled as he took his cowboy hat off, placing it on the table. Neither have I. Whatever that thing was, it's still out there. I responded, looking out the window towards the, the moonlit pastures. In case you were wondering, Zeus and Maxim are doing fine. They were a little banged up, but after a few days they were back on the job, rounding up cattle like nothing happened. I hired a few more ranch hands to do nightly inspections around the pasture, to make sure the cattle were not being harmed. So far it has been working. The guys were also telling me about seeing strange lights hovering over the property. I don't even want to think about what that could entail. Last summer, I started going on walks at night. It was a good way to relieve myself from the stresses of life, most oppressing of which were work and trying to be a good parent for my daughter. It was easier during the school year when she would be at kindergarten while I was at work but this obviously wasn't an option from late June to early September. I couldn't leave her at home alone, and I didn't get off work until 3 p.m. at the earliest. So she needed a daycare, which placed an even higher financial burden on us, which in turn meant I often had to work longer hours. The struggles of making a living as a single parent often discolored how I viewed the world. The innumerable days lost vibrancy, and I found myself falling into a deep depression. I did everything within my power to remain a beacon of security for my daughter, but I knew she could see my despair. Children are quite intuitive when it comes to sensing the emotions of their parents. She was my only comfort, and I ensured our home remained a stable place for her to grow. One night, after I had put her to bed, I sat on the porch for a while and watched the sun set. As the last pink rays disappeared behind the trees, I found myself staring up at the dark blue sky full of faint stars. For the first time in months, some of the color had returned to life. I went inside to check up on my daughter, who was already fast asleep. I quietly slipped out the front door and gently closed it behind me. I figured no harm would come from me taking a short walk. The night air was refreshing, and the Pennsylvanian back roads I lived on were quiet. 
save for the lively buzzing of insects. There are only a few houses on my street, interspaced among thick stretches of deep forest. At the end of the road, about a mile from my house, was a small rustic church no longer used by any congregation. I walked as far as there and did a lap around its empty parking lot before heading home. By the time I was on my porch again, it had been almost an hour. I wanted to stay out later, but I had to work the next morning. As I settled into bed that night, I realized there was something new I loved doing and the world felt a little brighter. For the remainder of the summer, I continued going on walks to the church and back nightly. It was my one escape from life where I could just enjoy myself without responsibility. I even began leaving my phone at home so there would truly be no distractions that would creep into my downtime. I'm sure my neighbors thought I was weird, as a few of them would occasionally drive past me on the dark, narrow road. I would always wave to them and smile as they passed, but I could only imagine how it felt to be driving through a tunnel of trees on a dark night, only to see someone standing on the side of the road. I probably unintentionally scared the shit out of at least someone. Eventually the air began to bite and the leaves ripened to a crispy brown. I maintained my habitual walks well into the fall, but it soon became too cold to continue going on them. I had to stop for the winter, and once again, the color drained from the world. The two things that kept me going were my daughter and the knowledge that I would be able to resume my night walks as soon as the warm weather began to return. After a few months that lasted for an eternity, spring reared itself once again. The grass turned Easter basket green, and small budding leaves peppered the barren woods. My daughter was happy to be able to play outside, and I was grateful to resume the one activity that brought peace to my life. Blissfully unaware that said activity would soon be the catalyst which would tear my life apart. It was early July. I had made it as far as the old church and was surprised to find that the parking lot was occupied this time. On the side of the building where the parking lot ended and the wood line began was a single nondescript van. It was white and had no windows, save for the driver and passenger side doors. It was the exact kind of van one would stereotype as being driven by a balding old man who offered candy to children. I was very unsettled to see the vehicle, but I forced myself not to think too much of it. I told myself somebody was moving something into or out of the old church and had left the van there overnight. Still, I hastened my lap around the parking lot upon seeing it. It made me eager to start my way trek back home. I found myself walking in the middle of the road. Normally, I would walk on the furthest left-hand side so any vehicles coming up behind me could pass easily. But that night, something about the air was different. The rustling of the wildlife around me kept changing between being aggressively heavy and deathly still, and I was afraid when walking too close to the woods. The center of the road made me an easy target for an oncoming motorist, but at least nothing could reach out and grab me unexpectedly. When I was about a third of the way back home, I heard something in the forest I hadn't heard before. It sounded like a distant voice faintly echoing through the trees, though I couldn't hear it very clearly. My skin chilled and my breath halted. I crept forward slowly. The only thing continuing to propel me onwards was the thought that I had to get home to be truly safe. I soon fully understood what it was that I was hearing. It was a woman's voice, maybe some hundred feet or so back into the woods. She was crying, sobbing. Her voice was strained, and she sounded like she was in agonizing pain. Immediately, dozens of scenarios played out in my mind, each one more terrible than the last. I then remembered that I did not have my phone on me. Who, or whatever was in those woods, I had a responsibility to my daughter. I had to ensure my own safety, so I sprinted home as fast as my legs would carry me. It still took my almost five minutes to get there. When I got inside, I immediately called 911 and told them there was a woman in the woods near my home. It took the police 15 minutes to arrive at my door. When they did, I told them what had happened. Those damn officers couldn't wrap their heads around why I was out walking to begin with. It took another 20 minutes for them to even drive to where I had heard the voice and shine a light into the woods. Nothing. They told me someone would do a search of the area the next day. I didn't sleep that night. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't stop thinking about the voice. I also couldn't escape the feeling that the police didn't take my claim seriously. 
They would, though. Morning came. I dropped my daughter off at daycare and I went to work. I was drowsy, and my performance suffered as a result. By the time I had gotten off work, though, I had completely forgotten about the events of the night prior. Said events remained out of mind until I was driving back home and saw three squad cars parked on the side of the road, next to where I heard the voice. An officer was next to one of the vehicles and waved me to pass by. I slowed down and asked him what had happened. He was vague but said there had been an accident. From how he looked across from me and back I could tell he was hesitant to speak freely in front of my daughter. I felt my stomach drop but kept driving. I knew right away something terrible had happened. I wouldn't find out until a day later, though, when everyone in our community was talking about it. A body had been found in the woods, the body of a young woman, college age to be specific. There were deep lacerations all over her. The investigators determined that she had been horribly abused elsewhere and left to bleed out in the woods alone. It had been a slow, torturous death, and it could have been prevented if someone had only helped her in time. I told the police about the white van I had seen next to the church that night. Of course, nothing ever came of it. Nothing came of the rest of the case, either. It went completely cold. I saw the faces of the grieving parents on the news, talking about the incredible person their daughter had been. Every time I saw her face, I was reminded of my own daughter. A terrible fear overwhelmed my life. The fear of knowing she was being raised into a world where something like that could potentially happen to her someday. I started drinking after that, routinely like clockwork, until I would stop thinking and be able to fall asleep. I also stopped taking night walks. For a while, anyway. Why would I want to risk experiencing something like that again? But then the realization set in that maybe I could have done something. What if I had conquered my fear and just called out back to her? What if I had my cell phone on me and I was able to call for help right away? Who was to say whoever had murdered the first woman wouldn't leave another victim to die in the woods? I started taking my walks again, about two months after the incident. I took my time during them, trying to drag them out for as long as possible. By lingering, I figured I was maximizing the possibility of hearing somebody else if they needed help. I always brought my phone with me then, as well as a flashlight. My neighbors soon took notice that I was back to my old pattern again. This time, though, they started treating me with hostility and suspicion. Never mind that I was the one who heard the young woman and called the police. I was now the weird man who was still stalking the roads after a local tragedy. They stopped waving to me casually when we passed each other. If we met in public, they would pretend they didn't see me. My daughter even told me that many of the kids she went to school with said I was a freak and that their parents instructed them to avoid me. By extent, that included her. At nights, my walks lasted longer each time. I became obsessed with the thought that maybe, if I stayed out just a little bit longer, I would have the opportunity to help someone else. It reached a tipping point when I had just gotten home from a walk, but couldn't escape the feeling that that night was different. I had to work the next morning, but how could one day's performance at my job ever compare in value to the life of another person? I went on a second walk that night. I heard nothing. Nothing happened. My performance was terrible the next day. My boss even sent me home early. Normally I got off work an hour before my daughter was let out from daycare, but now I had most of the day still ahead of me. I decided to take a nap for a few hours. I figured I'd set my alarm and be awake before I had to go pick her up. However, in my tired state I had forgotten to change my alarm from a.m. to p.m. I was woken up fifteen minutes after I was supposed to have been there for her by the sound of my phone ringing as she called to ask where I was. She wouldn't say anything to me as we drove home. That night, I couldn't sleep after the nap I had, so even though it was counterintuitive, I took another night walk. And so it continued. I kept performing worse and worse each day. My relationship with my daughter strained. The tiredness only amplified my paranoid sense of responsibility to act. Next time some sick monster dumped another victim in the woods, I'd be there. All the while, my drinking kept increasing to numb the discomfort from the stress. I got fired three months ago. My boss brought me into his office and told me to sit down. I knew what was going to happen before it did. My performance had deteriorated so much, it just wasn't profitable to employ me anymore. I didn't find work after that. 
and due to the circumstances of my firing, I didn't qualify to receive unemployment benefits. I had enough money saved away to last me for a little while, but life quickly burned through it, and soon I had to decide between paying my rent and putting food in my daughter's mouth. The choice was obvious, but it was still devastating to receive the notice of eviction. The worst was yet to come. Homelessness was not an option for a young child. With no relatives for my daughter to live with, child services got involved. I was forced to take a psychological welfare test, the results of which, along with my failure to hold down a job, led the government to conclude I was unfit to be a parent. I still remember my daughter's screams as social workers pulled her away from me and told her she had to go with them. That was two days ago. I haven't heard anything about her since. I'm writing this now from one of the computers at the public library. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. I miss my daughter so much and wish I could tell her I'm sorry for failing as a parent. The library's closing soon. I think I'm going to walk my street all night tonight. It's not like I have anything to wake up for tomorrow. Hello, I've been a fan of your YouTube channel and podcasts for a while now and thought that I'd submit this creepy encounter I had at my old job as a shuttle driver after telling this story around a campfire to some friends who really enjoyed hearing about it. During the worst part of the pandemic, I worked as a shuttle driver hostel manager for a hostel in Glasgow, Virginia, that catered to Appalachian trail hikers passing through that part of the Blue Ridge Mountains. I had been working here for several months while attending online classes for my first semester of grad school in the fall of 2020. On one Tuesday morning, I woke up early as I always did to start my chores for the day, cleaning bedsheets, doing inventory on our supplies, and checking the shuttle vehicles before the start of the day. After I finished my chores for the morning, my work phone rang, and when I answered, Charlie, our dispatcher and shuttle coordinator, greeted me in his thick Boston accent. Morning, he said. How's everything going down there? Morning, Charlie, I said, before filling him in on the guest count and inventory item counts for that morning. Charlie took note of the hikers currently staying at the hostel and the items that he needed to bring me from our main location in the next town over, where he was calling me from, before giving me the rundown for that day's shuttle rides. Let's see, this morning I've got you driving up to Humpback Trailhead to pick up a customer at 11.45. I checked the clock on the wall and saw that it was about 9. Okay, I said. If I leave now, then I can make it by 11.45 easy. After that, I hung up the phone and got ready to head out. A few other customers had stayed at the hostel the night before and were now lounging around in the comfy deck chairs that we had set up around the campfire pit the night before. I didn't know the real names of any of the customers that came through the hostel. Most hikers on the Appalachian Trail are given nicknames by their friends or people that they encounter on the trail and many choose to go by their nicknames rather than their real first names. The nicknames are always meant to be ironic or make fun of the person in some way. As I walked out onto the front porch and past the circle of lawn chairs where Hats Off, Rescue, Pilgrim, Mischief, and our friend Six String were all chatting and having their morning coffee. I waved at them and told them I'd be back later that day after I picked up our new customer. His nickname was Five Buck Chuck. I pulled out of the short driveway and headed down the road toward the Blue Ridge Parkway, which would take me north toward the trailhead, where I was supposed to meet Five Buck Chuck. A few hours later I arrived and sat waiting in my shuttle since I had gotten there a few minutes early. No cell service meant that I couldn't contact the customer so there was nothing to do but sit back and hope he showed up at the appointed time, not always a guarantee with some of the hikers. After a few minutes of waiting, I saw the top of someone's head pop up from behind a low wall on the other side of the parking area. I don't remember many details about Five Buck Chuck or any of the customers that I met when I worked at the hostel, but his head topped with a bright green baseball cap sticks out in my memory. As he climbed up the steep hill leading to the parking area, I could see more of him and assumed that he was the guy that I was supposed to meet. I stepped out of the shuttle vehicle and waved to him. I caught his attention, and as the hiker in the green hat crossed the dirt parking lot toward me, I noticed that he was walking with a slight limp. As he approached me, I called out to him, Good morning. Are you five buck chuck? The hiker replied, Yes, sir. Are you the guy from the hostel? I replied, yep, 
and offered to help him load his pack into the back of the shuttle, and once he and his gear were loaded up, I started the engine and began the drive back to Glasgow. Most of the hikers that I picked up liked to talk a lot. Many of them were coming into town after days in the wilderness and would excitedly tell me about all the cool adventures that they'd had since they last stopped at a town. Five Buck Chuck was different. He seemed tired, but I thought I'd try to strike up a conversation anyway to see if he felt like talking. So what brings you into town, I asked, briefly glancing back at Five Buck Chuck and his green baseball cap through the rearview mirror of the shuttle. I just need to rest a bit and resupply, he said. I banged up my leg last week, and I wouldn't mind giving it a few days to recover before I keep hiking south. Sorry to hear that, I replied. I know we've got some foot wraps and icy hoy packs back at the hostel that you're welcome to use once we get back there. Thanks, he said, before telling me a little bit more about what had happened to him. He said that he had been staying at another hostel in a town north of us, and when he had left that hostel, rather than taking the shuttle back to the trail, he had decided to walk back to the trailhead instead, and as he had been crossing the Blue Ridge Parkway, a pickup truck had hit him in the crosswalk, and he'd spent a few days in the hospital, recovering before continuing down the trail. That was pretty much our whole conversation as we drove back into town. After I offered him some words of sympathy, he said thanks, and for the rest of the drive we were both silent. Most of the time, hikers fall asleep during the ride back into town, and I figured that Five Buck Chuck was probably just passed out in the back seat. When we returned to the hostel, I was in a hurry. It was 2.08, and I was late for my two o'clock online class. I told Chuck that I needed to take care of something and that I would help him settle in once I was done. I didn't wait for a reply before hurrying inside and logging into my class. An hour or so later, I logged out and closed my laptop. Standing up, I decided to go look and see if Chuck needed any help getting settled in. I looked for him in every room of the hostel. I didn't find him in any of the bunk rooms, and I didn't hear the shower running. I wondered if he was outside hanging out around the campfire pit with hats off, rescue, and the others. I stepped out into the yard and saw that the hikers who had stayed the night before were all still sitting around in their chairs, chatting away. However, I didn't see Chuck anywhere and when I asked if anyone knew where the guy was that I had dropped off earlier, Hatsoff responded, saying that I hadn't dropped anyone off earlier and no one else had gotten out of the car after I rushed into the house. My first thought was that they were messing with me as this group was known to do, and so I looked all around the outside of the house to see if he was hanging out around somewhere. I didn't find him anywhere in the yard, and so frustrated, I returned to the shuttle vehicle and searched the back seat. The car was empty and Chuck's gear was gone from the cargo compartment. The only thing that I found in the car was a wadded-up five-dollar bill that had been wedged in between the back seat cushions. And with that, I figured that Chuck had run off without paying and that I'd been ripped off. In 2022, I graduated with my master's degree and returned to the Blue Ridge Mountains, this time working as the leader of a trail maintenance crew working in Shenandoah National Park. One day, when my crew needed to stop in one of the nearby towns to resupply, we decided to stop in at one of the nearby hostels just for the heck of it. When we arrived at the hostel, I started flipping through the logbook that they kept in the kitchen. The signatures of all the hikers who had stayed there lined the pager, and I was looking to see if there was anyone that I knew. On the page from October 2020, I found the signatures of Hats Off, Rescue, Six String, and Pilgrim, and chuckled to myself, remembering the hikers that I'd met two years before. As I turned the page to September 2020, I saw five Buck Chuck's signature and remembered the whole incident that I'd forgotten about until that moment. I picked up the book and brought it over to the sweet old lady who managed the hostel and asked if she remembered the guy who'd skipped out on me two years before. She looked at his name in the log book, and a knowing expression came over her face. The woman managing the hostel said that he had stayed at her hostel two years earlier for three nights, and when he had left he'd been hit by a pickup truck while crossing the road. Apparently, another hiker had seen the whole thing and called an ambulance after the truck driver decided to hit and run. 5. Buck Chuck had been taken to the hospital and passed away due to his injuries that night. You've got to be kidding, I said, which seemed to surprise her. I then told her about my encounter with Chuck two weeks after the hit-and-run incident, 
and we both looked at each other. Wherever Chuck is, I hope he's well, and I hope that he found peace after his long journey. I can't help but admire him for his utter determination that even death couldn't keep him from finishing the trail. Today, I'm saving up some money and working to eventually hike the Appalachian Trail myself. Thanks, Chuck, for being an inspiration and also for being the only customer to leave me a tip at my hostel job. I definitely enjoyed sharing this story, and if it gets read on the channel, I will definitely be submitting more stories as I've had many creepy experiences and encounters to share with you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening if you've stayed up to this point. If you haven't done so yet, please hit the like button, subscribe, and the notification bell to be notified when future episodes are released.